What's that you say? <clears throat> late. Oh, well, what's late among friends, hmm? Hi, friends. Good evening. Hope things are going well with you tonight. I want to read something. I don't know why 10 p.m. on a Wednesday night should lend itself so wholly to the weird. But don't deny it's true. Don't fight it, friends. Oh, yes. The weird... The weird comes for you. Embrace it. Lean into it. Let it take you out of the world. Let it take you where it will. Hey. <laughs> Good evening. <clears throat> Got all that housework done. So, um, we've been, been reading a little proto-weird, a little 1908, little Howard P. Lovecraft in short pants. Um, and, hmm, the house on the borderland. We've navigated chapters one, two, three, and four. And we've made our way to a little something called Chapter 5, The Thing in the Pit. This house is, as I have said before, surrounded by a huge estate and wild and uncultivated gardens. Away at the back, distant some 300 yards, is a dark, deep ravine spoken of as the Pit by the peasantry. At the bottom runs a sluggish stream so overhung by trees as scarcely to be seen from above. In passing, I must explain that this river has a subterranean origin, emerging suddenly at the east end of the ravine and disappearing as abruptly beneath the cliffs that form its western extremity. It was some months after my vision, if vision it were, of the great plain that my attention was particularly attracted to the pit. I happened one day to be walking along its southern edge when suddenly several pieces of rock and shale were dislodged from the face of the cliff immediately beneath me and fell with a sullen crash through the trees. I heard them splash in the river at the bottom and then silence. I should not have given this incident more than a passing thought had not Pepper at once begun to bark savagely, nor would he be silent when I bade him, which is most unusual behavior on his part. Feeling that there must be someone or something in the pit, I went back to the house quickly for a stick. When I returned, Pepper had ceased his barks and was growling and smelling uneasily along the top. Whistling to him to follow me, I started to descend cautiously. The depth to the bottom of the pit must be about a um, hundred and fifty feet, and some time as well as considerable care was expended before we reached the bottom in safety. Once down, Pepper and I started to explore along the banks of the river. It was very dark there due to the, to the overhanging trees, and I, I moved warily, keeping my glance about me and my stick ready. Pepper was quiet now and kept close to me all the time. Thus we searched right up one side of the river without hearing or seeing anything. Then we crossed over by the simple method of jumping and commenced to beat our way back through the underbrush. We had accomplished perhaps half the distance when I heard again the sound of falling stones on the other side, the side from which we had just come. One large rock came thundering down through the treetops, struck the opposite bank, and bounded into the river, driving a great jet of water right over us. At this, Pepper gave out a deep growl, then stopped and pricked up his ears. I listened, too. 
A second later, a loud, half-human, half-pig-like squeal sounded from among the trees, apparently about halfway up the south cliff. It was answered by a similar note from the bottom of the pit. At this, Pepper gave a short, sharp bark, and, springing across the little river, disappeared into the bushes. Immediately after, I heard his barks increase in depth and number, and in between their sound, there sounded a noise of confused jabbering. This ceased, and in the su su succeeding silence, there rose a semi-human yell of agony. Almost immediately, Pepper gave a long, drawn howl of pain, and then the shrubs were violently agitated, and he came running out with his tail down and glancing as he ran over his shoulder. As he reached me, I saw that he was bleeding from what appeared to be a great claw wound in the side that had almost laid bare his ribs. Seeing Pepper thus mutilated, a furious feeling of anger seized me, and whirling my staff, I, I sprang across and into the bushes from which Pepper had emerged. As I forced my way through, I thought I heard a sound of breathing, Next instant, I had burst into a little clear space, just in time to see something, livid white in color, disappear among the bushes on the opposite side. With a shout, I ran toward it, but though I struck and probed among the bushes with my stick, I neither saw nor heard anything further, and so returned to Pepper. There, after bathing his wound in the river, I bound my wetted handkerchief round his body, having done which, we retreated up the ravine and into the daylight again. On reaching the house, my sister inquired what had happened to Pepper, and I told her he had been fighting with the wild cat, of which I had heard there were several about. I felt it would be better not to tell her how it had really happened, though to be sure I scarcely knew myself. But this I did know that the thing I had seen run into the bushes was no wildcat. It was much too big and had, so far as I had observed, a skin like a hog's, only of a dead, unhealthy white color. And then it had run upright, or nearly so, upon its hind feet with a motion somewhat resembling that of a human being. This much I had noticed in my brief glimpse, and truth to tell, I felt a good deal of uneasiness besides curiosity as I turned the matter over in my mind. It was in the morning that the above incident had occurred. Then it would be after dinner, as I sat reading, that, happening to look up suddenly, I saw something peering in over the window ledge, the eyes and ears alone showing. A pig, by Jove, I said, and rose to my feet. Thus I saw the thing more completely. But it was no pig. God alone knows what it was. It reminded me vaguely of the hideous thing that had haunted the great arena. It had a grotesque human mouth and jaw, but with no chin of which to speak. The nose was pro prolonged into a snout. Thus it was that with the little eyes and queer ears gave it such an extraordinarily swine-like appearance. Of forehead there was little and the whole face was of an unwholesome white color. For perhaps a moment, I, I stood looking at the thing with an ever-growing grow feeling of disgust and some fear. The mouth kept jabbering inanely and once emitted a half-swinish grunt. I think it was the eyes that attracted me the most. They seemed to glow at times with a horribly human intelligence and kept flickering away from my face over the details of the room as though my stare disturbed it. It appeared to be supporting itself by two claw-like hands upon the windowsill. These claws, unlike the face, were of a clay brown hue and bore an indistinct resemblance to human hands, in that they had four fingers and a thumb though these were webbed up to the first joint, much as are a duck's. Nails it had also, but so long and powerful that they were more like the talons of an eagle than aught else. As I have said before, I felt some fear, though almost of an impersonal kind. I may explain my feeling better by saying that it was more a sensation of abhorrence 
such as one might expect to feel if brought in contact with something superhumanly foul, something unholy, belonging to some hitherto undreamt state of existence. I cannot say that I grasped these various details of the brute at the time. I think they seemed to come back to me afterward as though imprinted upon my brain. I imagined more than I saw as I looked at the thing, and the material details grew upon me later. For perhaps a minute, I stared at the creature. Then, as my nerves steadied a little, I shook off the vague alarm that held me and took a step toward the window. Even as I did so, the thing ducked and vanished. I rushed to the door and looked round hurriedly, but only the tangled bushes and shrubs met my gaze. I ran back into the house and, getting my gun, sallied out to search through the gardens. As I went, I asked myself whether the thing I had just seen was likely to be the same of which I had caught a glimpse in the morning. I inclined to think it was. I would have taken Pepper with me, but judged it better to give his wound a chance to heal. Besides, if the creature I had just seen was, as I imagined, his antagonist of the morning, it was not likely that he would be of much use. I began my search systematically. I was determined, if it were possible, to find and put an end to that swine thing. This was at least a material horror. At first I searched, cautiously, with the thought of Pepper's wound in my mind. But as the hours passed and not a sign of anything living showed in the great lonely gardens, I became less apprehensive. I felt almost as though I would welcome the sight of it. Anything seemed better than this silence, with the ever-present feeling that the creature might be lurking in every bush I passed. Later, I grew careless of danger, to the extent of plunging right through the bushes, probing with my gun barrel as I went. At times I shouted, but only the echoes answered back. I thought thus perhaps to frighten or stir the creature to showing itself, but only succeeded in bringing my sister Mary out, to know what was the matter. I told her that I had seen the wildcat that had wounded Pepper and that I was trying to hunt it out of the bushes. She seemed only half satisfied and went back into the house with an expression of doubt upon her face. I wondered whether she had seen or guessed anything. For the rest of the afternoon, I prosecuted the search anxiously. I felt that I should be unable to sleep with that bestial thing haunting the shrubberies and yet when evening fell, I had seen nothing. Then, as I turned homeward, I heard a short, unintelligible noise among the bushes to my right. Instantly, I turned and, aiming quickly, fired in the direction of the sound. Immediately afterward, I heard something scuttling away among the bushes. It moved rapidly and, in a minute, had gone out of hearing. After a few steps, I ceased my pursuit, realizing how futile it must be in the fast-gathering gloom and so, with a curious feeling of depression, I entered the house. That night, after my sister had gone to bed, I went round to all the windows and doors on the ground floor and saw to it that they were securely fastened. This precaution was scarcely necessary as regard the windows, as all of those on the lower story are strongly barred, but with the doors, of which there are five, it was wisely thought, as not one was locked. Having secured these, I went to my study, yet somehow for once the place jarred upon me. It seemed so huge and echoey. For some time I tried to read, but at last, finding it impossible, I carried my book down to the kitchen, where a large fire was burning, and sat there. I dare say I had read for a couple of hours when suddenly I heard a sound that made me lower my book and listen intently. It was a noise of something rubbing and fumbling against the back door. Once the door creaked loudly, as though force were being applied to it, during those few short moments I experienced an indescribable feeling of terror, such as I should have believed impossible. My hands shook, a cold sweat broke out on me, and I shivered violently. Gradually I calmed. The stealthy movements outside had ceased. Then for an hour I sat silent and watchful. All at once the feeling of fear took me again. I felt as I imagine an animal must under the eye of a snake. 
Yet now I could hear nothing. Still, there was no doubting that some unexplained influence was at work. Gradually, imperceptibly almost, something stole on my ear, a sound that resolved itself into a faint murmur. Quickly it developed and grew into a muffled but hideous chorus of bestial shrieks. It appeared to rise from the bowels of the earth. I heard a thud and realized in a dull, half-comprehending way that I had dropped my book. After that, I just sat, and thus the daylight found me when it crept wanly in through the barred, high windows of the great kitchen. With the dawning light, the feeling of stupor and fear left me, and I came more into possession of my senses. Thereupon, I picked up my book and crept to the door to listen. Not a sound broke the chilly silence. For some minutes I stood there, then very gradually and cautiously I drew back the bolt and opened the door to peer out. My caution was unneeded. Nothing was to be seen save the gray vista of dreary, tangled bushes and trees extending to the distant plantation. With a shiver, I closed the door and made my way quietly up to bed. Chapter 6 the swine things. It was evening a week later. My sister sat in the garden, knitting. I was walking up and down, reading. My gun leant against the wall of the house, for since the advent of that strange thing in the gardens, I had deemed it wise to take precautions. Yet, through the whole week, there had been nothing to alarm me, either by sight or sound, so that I was able to look back calmly to the incident, though still with a sense of unmitigated wonder and curiosity. I was, as I have just said, walking up and down and somewhat engrossed in my book. Suddenly I heard a crash, away in the direction of the pit. With a quick movement, I turned and saw a tremendous column of dust rising high into the evening air. My sister had risen to her feet with a sharp exclamation of surprise and fright. Telling her to stay where she was, I snatched up my gun and ran toward the pit. As I neared it, I heard a dull, rumbling sound that grew quickly into a roar, split with deeper crashes, and up from the pit drove a fresh volume of dust. The noise ceased, though the dust still rose tumultuously. I reached the edge and looked down, but could see nothing save a boil of dust clouds swirling hither and thither. The air was so full of the small particles that they blinded and choked me, and finally I had to run out from the smother to breathe. Gradually the suspended matter sank and hung in a panoply over the mouth of the pit. I could only guess at what had happened. That there had been a landslip of some kind, I had little doubt, but the cause was beyond my knowledge, and yet even then I had half imaginings, for already the thought had come to me of those falling rocks and that thing in the bottom of the pit, but in the first minutes of confusion I failed to reach the natural conclusion to which the catastrophe pointed. Slowly, the dust subsided until presently I was able to approach the edge and look down. For a while, I peered impotently, trying to see through the reek. At first, it was impossible to make out anything. Then, as I stared, I saw something below, to my left, that moved. I looked intently toward it, and presently made out another, and then another, three dim shapes that appeared to be climbing up the side of the pit. I could see them only indistinctly. Even as I stared and wondered, I heard a rattle of stones somewhere to my right. I glanced across, but could see nothing. I leant forward and peered over and down into the pit, just beneath where I stood, and saw no further than a hideous white swine face that had risen to within a couple of yards of my feet. Below it I could make out several others. As the thing saw me, it gave a sudden, uncouth squeal which was answered from all parts of the pit. At that, a gust of horror and fear took me, and bending down, I discharged my gun right into its face. Straightway, the creature disappeared with a clatter of loose earth and stones. There was a momentary silence, to which probably I owe my life. For during it, I heard a quick patter of many feet, and turning sharply, saw a troop of the creatures coming toward me at a run. 
Instantly I raised my gun and fired at the foremost, who plunged headlong with a hideous howling. Then I turned to run. More than halfway from the house to the pit, I saw my sister. She was coming toward me. I could not see her face distinctly as the dusk had fallen, but there was fear in her voice as she called to know why I was shooting. Run, I shouted in reply. Run for your life. Without more ado, she turned and fled, picking up her skirts with both hands. As I followed, I gave a glance behind. The brutes were running on, on their hind legs, at times dropping on all fours. I think it must have been the terror in my voice that spurred Mary to run so, for I feel convinced that she had not as yet seen those hell creatures that pursued. On we went, my sister leading. Each moment the nearing sounds of footsteps told me that the brutes were gaining on us rapidly. Fortunately, I am accustomed to live in some ways an active life. As it was, the strain of the race was beginning to tell severely upon me. Ahead, I could see the back door. Luckily, it was open. I was some half-dozen yards behind Mary now, and my breath was sobbing in my throat. Then something touched my shoulder. I wrenched my head round quickly and saw one of those monstrous, pallid faces close to mine. One of the creatures, having outrun its companions, had almost overtaken me. Even as I turned, it made a fresh grab. With a sudden effort, I, I sprang to one side, and swinging my gun by the barrel, brought it crashing down upon the foul creature's head. The thing dropped with an almost human groan. Even this short delay had been nearly sufficient to bring the rest of the brutes down upon me, so that without an instant's waste of time, I turned and ran for the door. Reaching it, I, I burst into the passage, then, turning quickly, slammed and bolted the door just as the first of the creatures rushed against it with a sudden shock. My sister sat, gra gasping in, the, in a chair. She seemed in a fainting condition, but I had no time then to spend on her. I had to make sure that all the doors were fastened. Fortunately, they were. The one leading from my study into the gardens was the last to which I went. I had just had time to note that it was secured when I thought I heard a noise outside. I stood perfectly silent and listened. Yes, now I could distinctly hear a sound of whispering and something slithered over the panels with a rasping, scratchy noise. Evidently, some of the brutes were feeling with their claw hands about the door to discover whether there were any means of ingress. That the creatures should, be, so, should so soon have found the door was to me a proof of their reasoning capacities. It assured me that they must not be regarded by any means as mere animals. I had felt something of this before, when that first thing peered in through my window. Then I had applied the term superhuman to it, with an almost instinctive knowledge that the creature was something different from the brute beast, something beyond human yet in no good sense, but rather as something foul and hostile to the great and good in humanity. In a word, as something intelligent and yet inhuman. The very thought of the creature filled me with revulsion. Now I bethought me of my sister, and going to the cupboard I got out a flask of brandy and a wine glass. Taking these I went down to the kitchen, carrying a lighted candle with me. She was not sitting in the chair, but had fallen out and was lying upon the floor, face downward. Very gently, I turned her over and raised her head somewhat. Then I poured a little, little of the brandy between her lips. After a while, she shivered slightly, and a little later, she gave several gasps and opened her eyes. In a dreamy, unrealizing way, she looked at me. Then her eyes closed slowly, and I gave her a little more of the brandy. For perhaps a minute longer, she lay silent, breathing quickly. All at once, her eyes opened again, and it seemed to me as I looked that the pupils were dilated, as though fear had come with returning consciousness. Then, with a movement so unexpected that I started backwards, she sat up. Noticing that she seemed giddy, I put out my hand to steady her. At that, she gave a loud scream and, scrambling to her feet, ran from the room. For a moment, I stayed there, kneeling and holding the brandy flask. I was utterly puzzled and astonished. Could she be afraid of me? But no, why should she? 
I could only conclude that her nerves were badly shaken and that she was temporarily unhinged. Upstairs, I heard a door bang loudly, and I knew that she had taken refuge in her room. I put the flask down on the table. My attention was distracted by a noise in the direction of the back door. I went toward it and listened. It appeared to be shaken, as though some of the creatures struggled with it silently, but it was far too strongly constructed and hung to be easily moved. Out in the gardens rose a continuous sound. It might have been mistaken by a casual listener for the grunting and squealing of a herd of pigs. But as I stood there, it came to me that there was sense and meaning to all those swinish sounds. Gradually, I seemed able to trace a semblance in it to human speech. Glutinous and sticky, as though each articulation were made with difficulty, yet nevertheless I was becoming convinced that it was no mere medley of sounds, but a rapid interchange of ideas. By this time it had grown quite dark in the passages, and from these came all the various cries and groans of which an old house is so full after nightfall. It is no doubt because things are then quieter and one has more leisure to hear. Also, there may be something in the theory that the sudden change of temperature at sundown affects the structure of the house somewhat, causing it to contract and settle, as it were, for the night. However, this is as may be, but on that night in particular, I would gladly have been quit of so many eerie noises. It seemed to me that each crack and creak was the coming of one of those things along the dark corridors, though I knew in my heart that this could not be, for I had seen myself that all the doors were secure. Gradually, however, these sounds grew on my nerves to such an extent that were it only to punish my cowardice, I felt I must make the round of the basement again, and if anything were there, face it. And then I would go up to my study, for I knew sleep was out of the question with the house surrounded by creatures, half beasts, half something else, and entirely unholy. Taking the kitchen lamp down from its hook, I made my way from cellar to cellar and room to room, through pantry and coal hole, along passages and into the hundred and one little blind alleys and hidden nooks that form the basement of the old house. Then, when I knew I had been in every corner and cranny large enough to conceal aught of any size, I made my way to the stairs. With my foot on the first step, I paused. It seemed to me I heard a movement, apparently from the buttery, which is to the left of the staircase. It had been one of the first places I searched, and yet I felt certain my ears had not deceived me. My nerves were strung now, and with hardly any hes hesitation, I stepped up to the door, holding the lamp above my head. In a glance, I saw that the place was empty, save for the heavy stone slabs supported by brick pillars, and I was about to leave it, convinced that I had been mistaken, when in turning my light was flashed back from two bright spots outside the window and high up. For a few moments, I stood there staring. Then they moved, revolving slowly and throwing out alternate scintillations of green and red. At least so it appeared to me. I knew then that they were eyes. Slowly, I traced the shadowy outline of one of the things. It appeared to be holding onto the bars of the window, and its attitude suggested climbing. I went nearer to the window and held the light higher. There was no need to be afraid of the creature. The bars were strong, and there was little danger of its being able to move them. And then suddenly, in spite of the knowledge that the brute could not reach to harm me, I had a return of the horrible sensation of fear that had assailed me on that night a week previously. It was the same feeling of helpless, shuddering fright. I realized dimly that the creature's eyes were looking into mine with a steady, compelling stare. I tried to turn away, but could not. I seemed now to see the window through a mist. Then I thought other eyes came and peered, and yet others, until a whole galaxy of malignant, staring orbs seemed to hold me in thrall. My head began to swim and throb violently. 
Then I was aware of a feeling of acute physical pain in my left hand. It grew more severe and forced, literally forced, my attention. With a tremendous effort, I glanced down. And with that, the spell that had held me was broken. I realized then that I had, in my agitation, unconsciously caught hold of the hot lamp glass and burnt my hand badly. I looked up to the window again. The misty appearance had gone, and now I saw that it was crowded with dozens of bestial faces. With a sudden access of rage, I raised the lamp and hurled it full at the window. It struck the glass, smashing a pane, and passed between two of the bars out into the garden, scattering burning oil as it went. I heard several loud cries of pain, and as my sight became accustomed to the dark, I discovered that the creatures had left the window. Pulling myself together, I groped for the door and, having found it, made my way upstairs, stumbling at each step. I felt dazed, as though I had received a blow on the head. At the same time, my, my hand smarted badly and I was full of a nervous, dull rage against those things. Reaching my study, I lit the candles. As they burnt up, their rays were reflected from the rack of firearms on the sidewall. At the sight, I remembered that I had there a power, which, as I had proved earlier, seemed as fatal to those monsters as to more ordinary animals, and I determined I would take the offensive. First of all, I bound up my hand, for the pain was fast becoming intolerable. After that, it seemed easier, and I crossed the room to the rifle stand. There I selected a heavy rifle, an old and tried weapon, and having procured ammunition, ammunition, I made my way up into one of the small towers with which the house is crowned. From there I found that I could see nothing. The gardens presented a dim blur of shadows, a little blacker perhaps where the trees stood. That was all, and I knew that it was useless to shoot down into all that darkness. The only thing to be done was to wait for the moon to rise. Then I might be able to do a little execution. In the meantime, I sat still and kept my ears open. The gardens were comparatively quiet now, and only an occasional grunt or squeal came up to me. I did not like this silence. It made me wonder on what devilry the creatures were bent. Twice I left the tower and took a walk through the house, but everything was silent. Once I heard a noise from the direction of the pit, as though more earth had fallen. Following this, and lasting for some fifteen minutes, there was a commotion among the denizens of the garden. This died away, and after that all was again silent. About an hour later, the moon's light showed above the distant horizon. From where I sat, I could see it over the trees, but it was not until it rose clear of them that I could make out any of the details in the gardens below. Even then, I could see none of the brutes, until, happening to crane forward, I saw several of them lying prone up against the wall of the house. What they were doing I could not make out. It was, however, a chance too good to be ignored, and taking aim, I fired at the one directly beneath. There was a shrill scream, and as the smoke cleared away, I saw that it had turned on its back and was writhing feebly. Then it was quiet. The others had disappeared. Immediately after this, I heard a loud squeal in the direction of the pit. It was answered a hundred times from every part of the garden. This gave me some notion of the number of the creatures, and I began to feel that the whole affair was becoming even more serious than I had imagined. As I sat there, silent and watchful, the thought came to me, why was all this? What were these things? What did it mean? Then my thoughts flew back to that vision though even now I doubt whether it was a vision, of the plane of silence. What did that mean, I wondered, and that thing in the arena? Ugh, lastly I thought of the house I had seen in that faraway place, that house so like this in every detail of external structure that it might have been modeled from it, or this from that. I had never thought of that. At this moment there came another long squeal from the pit, followed a second later by a couple of shorter ones. At once the garden was filled with answering cries. I stood up quickly and looked over the parapet. In the moonlight, 
it seemed as though the shrubberies were alive. They tossed hither and thither, as though shaken by a strong, irregular wind, while a continuous rustling and a noise of scampering feet rose up to me. Several times I saw the moonlight gleam on running white figures among the bushes, and twice I fired. The second time my shot was answered by a short squeal of pain. A minute later, the gardens lay silent. From the pit came a deep, hoarse babble of swine talk. At times, angry cries smote the air, and they would be answered by multitudinous gruntings. It occurred to me that they were holding some kind of council, perhaps to discuss the problem of entering the house. Also, I thought that they seemed much enraged, probably by my successful shots. It occurred to me that now would be a good time to make a final survey of our defenses. This I proceeded to do at once, visiting the whole of the basement again and examining each of the doors. Luckily, they are all like the back one built of solid iron-studded oak. Then I went upstairs to the study. I was more anxious about this door. It is palpably of a more modern make than the others, and though a stout piece of work, it has little of their ponderous strength. I must explain here that there is a small raised lawn on this side of the house, upon which this door opens, the windows of the study being barred on this account. All the other entrances, excepting the great gateway, which is never opened, are in the lower story. Thanks for coming along on this little journey into the proto-weird, circa 1908. Um, our friend William Hope Hodgson um, is bringing us The House on the Borderland. This has been part three. Hope you'll come around tomorrow night at 10 for part four. Be kind to each other and stay weird.